Good morning, everyone. It is a blessing to be together. Your musicians this morning are Carolyn Bierke on the piano. Myself, I'm Emily Jaworski, your GA music coordinator. My dear friend, Elena Romero. And my other dear friend, Sarah Dan Jones, who you know and love. Throughout this service, please feel free to move the body you inhabit in any way that feels good to you. We have had several intense days. Your, your body may be processing things that your mind may not even be aware of. So we trust you to take care of yourself and give yourself what you need during this service. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit draw Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit draw Whether you ran in on little feet, walked in briskly, ambled in or rolled in, you are welcome here. Whatever religions you have known, whatever God you accept or deny, you are welcome here. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever body you live in, you are welcome here. Thank you for coming today, entering our community of faith and love once again, and opening yourself up to those around you. There are people here, some holding deep struggles and pain, others bringing joy and forgiveness. There are some that carry a longing for connection and love, some who find it difficult to be open and vulnerable, and some who find it easy. No matter what you hold or who you are, we are so glad that you are with us right now. Take a breath. Slow down. Be present. Let yourself be authentic and real. Let this be a sacred space, ready to welcome everyone with an open heart. Please rise as you're willing and able and join us in our opening hymn, I Know I Can.
These are the words of Paul Nyan Zugi. We light this chalice in honor of this moment in which we have gathered here together as a people of one common faith. We light this chalice in honor of change and movement, and for those who are called by faith to create justice and peace in the here and now. We light this chalice for immigrants and refugees around the world who have fled their homes for safety reasons. And for those among them who have found themselves in refugee camps, especially those in Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya. We light this chalice for separated families and those who feel lonely and isolated. Whether abroad or here in this room, may we all come to fully know the limitlessness of love. May it move within us and around us so that we might be consumed by it. And in that rapture, may we go forth and share it with others as it has no beginning and is never ending. Peace. Sometimes I'm beaten, sometimes I'm broke, cause sometimes this city is nothing but smoke. Is there a secret? Is there a code? Can we make it better? Cause I'm losing hope. Tell me how to be in this world. Tell me how to breathe in and feel no hurt. Tell me how, cause I believe in something. I believe in us. After the rest. After the dust, I still hear the howling, I still feel the rush over the riots, above all the noise, through all the worry, I still hear your voice. So tell me how to be in this world. Tell me how to breathe in and feel no hurt. Tell me how, cause I believe in something. I believe in us. So tell me when the light goes out, that even in the dark we can find a way out. Tell me now, cause I believe in something. I believe in us. We used to be kids living just for kicks in cinema seats learning how to kiss running through streets that were painted gold we never believed we'd grow up like this so tell me how to be in this world tell me how to breathe in and feel no hurt tell me now cause i believe in something i believe in us tell me when the light goes out that even in the dark we can find a way out tell me how cause i believe in something i believe in us i believe in something i believe in us are a circle. 
within a circle with no beginning and never ending. Good morning, beloveds. Sweet. I often use the salutation, beloved, and I love what it recognizes and invites forth in myself and for the person before me. And yet, beginning to name being loved was a near painful realization for me to embody at first. And it was the jumpstart of my journey of vulnerability as a tool for liberation. Let me unpack that. When I was a teenager, I babysat a lot. And I love hanging out with children. It's a hoot and a half. I love spending time with children of various abilities and ages and personalities. And I learned a lot about human behavior, particularly mine. I learned that if you want to witness magic, mystery, or whatever you name it, watch 15 three-year-olds with only one or two adults. The number of head-on collusions, toy-to-face impacts, and wipeouts that take out new teeth that don't happen? Saved by happenstance or incredible timing, it's wild and it's serendipity on high speed. For those exhausting and amazing shifts, I learned that there is something that holds us in relationship. We affect each other, and, are, and even when not made physical, we are connected to one another, woven into a tapestry of something. Another lesson I remember is one evening I was hanging out with a kiddo, and after a tumultuous invitation to clean up his room, I realized that cleaning the room wasn't the problem. It was the frustration at being invited to what to him felt like an outsider's burden. The standard of cleanliness that I was imposing. So I called time out and I led him through my lived practice of returning to awareness and addressing my needs so I may prepare for responsibility. We went to the kitchen and had a snack. And we talked about his day, where he's coming from, what happened at school, what his grandma recently told him. And we played and eventually we got back to his room and he cleaned up without the anger expressed earlier because he had tended to his own heart. And we had moved through the sticky instead of away. Later while tucking in my pal that night, that sweet seven-year-old looked me in the eyes and said, Thanks for being my friend. And then we proceeded to have a 30-minute conversation about death and letting go that he instigated. From that evening, I noted when we stay close, when we move with empathy and loving boundaries, when we seek to understand hurt in ourselves, we can not only have fun again, we can cultivate the grounds for greater connections, vulnerability, and responsible community partnership. We can be our own friend. And one final observation. After hours logged in conversation with bewildered infants, agency hungry two-year-olds, frustrated six-year-olds, and overwhelmed 11-year-olds, I found genuine concern is often at the source of an outlandish reaction. And for the journey to unpack and address tender fears and unspoken beliefs, harsh judgment would not benefit either of us. I also realize we're all still kids, especially adults, who I judged most harshly as a teen. The epiphany of the empathy we crave, the respect we need, the self-awareness we are responsible to, and the love we thrive on, no matter our age, followed me into my late teens. I was near the beginning of my mental health journey, and I came to nose to nose with a terrifying, daunting, great implications attached realization. The way I think, the chemicals in my brain, the people and the culture I am around, what I listen to and believe curates the mental state I am in. Society, poor theology, and my own bewilderment turned resentment burdened my soul. It riddled my heart with pinprick holes where my sense of worth, personhood, and wholeness were. The kids I babysat and nannied, who I recognized as dope humans deserving of love and care, 
were also the greatest hopes I had for myself, to recognize I am whole and I am growing. Yes. I am, we are lovable, full of potential, and ever shaping our world. Like the first line in the chant today, we are a circle, cycling and moving whole and sweet. And the most naked I ever felt was when I dared remember I inherently matter. It was a tough cookie to face. And when I championed having a right to love and acceptance from my idea of God and myself, the vulnerability train doesn't stop there. I had help learning the judgmental climate my heart, mind and heart were in, and I need help. I need a village in unlearning it and to start relearning greater truth and love. The audacity I just tested, like a swatch of color against my arm, needed to be replicated, sized up, and expanded. So basically, I needed to dunk myself in the bright and nerve-wracking shade of vulnerability with a courage primer. When I began the journey of self-awareness, responsibility, and compassion, I was surprised and relieved. Y'all, there's nourishment along the way. It comes from others also on the path, sharing empathy and personal experiences. It's the interpersonal expansion of what Zen Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh teaches in eating meditation. When eating fruit, he invites you to imagine the people that prepared it, transported it, picked it, planted it. Imagine the sun, moon, and stars that shined over it, the breeze and animals that kept it company. And he continues on and on, and soon you take bites of anything with incredible gratitude. That truly the universe conspired for what is in your mouth, the nourishment inside, and countless lives are invested in your meal. My liberation depends on greeting myself each day and practicing to greet all y'all with such wonder. Knowing I come from a village of humans who come from a community of humans who come from more humans who come from a legacy and lineage of humans, we go on and on and reach far into our ancestry, lives lived long ago. Their journey lining up to create the conditions for my own. I come from a church and a school and a society, a system which works and is in larger and larger systems, expanding and collaborating out. We are circles and we benefit by remembering we are within circles and connected to others still. In short, we are not void or separate from the systems we are shaped by and we are not exempt from the task of shaping them back. Vulnerability is bursting our privilege bubble of separateness by inquiring and addressing our six or less degrees of separation to oppression of all kinds. Oppression in our home is linked across the globe. Ageism and ableism are knotted with heteronormativity, gender binaries, unchecked religiosity, and perfectionism. Did you know environmental and economic injustice is firmly linked to racism? classism, forced migration, and reckless theology. All isms are terribly woven into the fabrics of each of our lives, and it demands vulnerability laced with courage to admit this, explore this, and address this in ourselves and in community. It's one thing to peek at this ever-expanding web of connections we are bound in, and it's another to be in relationship with it. We aren't woke by simply acknowledging it briskly and moving along. We don't elicit justice or equity by staying unmuddied and unbruised on the sidelines, protected by the illusion of otherness and purity. We are revolutionaries when we dare to be proximate and cultivate healthy relationship. We midwife a transformed world when we are immersed in the sticky we are shapers of change when our baseline is participation and collaboration in the massive work at hand. Not distant commentary, distraction, or aversions. We are warriors of love when we get so good at loving our holy selves and one another in overflow. It transforms the geography of our relationships and systems. We are who we have been waiting for. 
when our courage overthrows the illusion of exceptionalism and vulnerability cultivates the grounds of living in service to a vision for a community and world that is inclusive, diverse, and growing. We are powerful and divine, and we are called into courageous and vulnerable relationship with the people, systems, and institutions we are woven among, especially those we have covenanted with. Simply put, we are a circle within a circle. And I deeply appreciate the balance in this chant and other Earth-centric traditions where the magic and expansion of who we are is presented with the equally important practice of humility and wonder. So a little personal, I am incredibly grateful that I came across a Unitarian Universalist community, All Souls in Tulsa, and joined five years ago. And I think it's pretty neat that I'm a minister now, and I'll get ordained in October. <laughs> I have entered covenant with colleagues and congregates anew in the ever-growing and transforming circles we are. Unitarian Universalism is so many things that I love and I respect, but today I want to list the things we're not. We are not inventors of justice. We are not the origin points of love. We are not soul revolutionaries or by any means the only group of big-hearted, deeply convicted people committed to coming together and creating at the intersecting points of our physical lives and our highest transcendental theological aspirations. In short, we are not alone. So yes, I'm inviting us here the annual gathering of Unitarian Universalists to remember we're not the only ones doing this. And if that irks you, or is a bummer, or maybe an insult, then my beloved, forget not how rad and delicious each and every one of us are. We are not exceptional, but we are incredibly unique. We only happen like this, come together like this once in history. Each moment is a blessing. We are the juice that brings personality and uniqueness to the arc of history, more grand than our lifespans. We are circles, whole and divine, and if we are in relationship, close proximity with ourselves and others, we can appreciate and be transformed by one another. So instead, yes, yes. So instead, my statements of what we are not are freaking exciting, y'all. We didn't invent justice or the practice of seeking liber liberation. We aren't the only bank of histories and stories and programs striving to bend towards love. That means back home and here together, there are so many other circles, traditions, institutions, and people we have yet to get to know and be informed by and loved. That means we aren't the first or the last in the arena of vulnerability and courage, of society shaping and self-transformation. That means we have collaborators, partners, empathizers, friends, and a broader community network yet to tap into and flourish with. This means we can know how mightily vital we are and humbly cherish gratitude and awe for the, mo the movement much larger than ourselves we partake in. Gratitude and awe. Gratitude and awe are actually much more sustainable and sweet to a lifestyle, a lifestyle, not a fad, a lifestyle of courage and vulnerability that say pride and elitism which burn fast and bright, but leave you cold and chilled to the bone after the hype. Gratitude and awe put us in a posture to be open-hearted and to get in and stay in healthy relationship. Pride and elitism convince us to isolate our genius so we can thrive unpolluted. 
yet not realizing it will cut you off from the nutrients you need to survive. We are no island, no mythical hero. We are a circle within a circle with no beginning and never ending. Please join us in that chant. We've unpacked each line from this understanding of the declaration and the commitment to vulnerability and courage. Lift your voice however you do. If you would like, imagine in your mind's eye a lotus flower blooming and opening and inside another lotus flower. An endless chain of life and death begetting life and death. Or imagine yourself, your lifespan before you, hundreds of thousands of people and their lives. And after you, whether you procreate or not, hundreds and thousands of people. Not one of us comes into this world or leaves untouched by infinite lives. So let us begin. Please rise in body and spirit. We are a circle within a circle with no beginning and never ending. We are a circle within a circle with no beginning and never ending. We are a circle within a circle. Join us in singing Profetisa. Profetisa, pueblo mío, profetiza una vez más que tu voz se alejó del clamor de los pueblos en opresión. Profetiza, pueblo mío, profetiza una vez más, anuncia. Pueblo 
For this benediction, um, I ask you to hold hands with the person next to you if you are willing and able. The hand in yours from Reverend Erica A. Hewitt. The hand in yours belongs to a person whose heart is sometimes tender, whose skin is sometimes thin, whose eyes sometimes fill with tears and whose laughter is a beautiful sound. The hand that you hold belongs to a person who is seeking wholeness and trusts that you're doing the same. As you leave this sanctuary, may your hearts remain open, may your voices stay strong, and may your hands remain outstretched. as we celebrate our 165th anniversary. I came to build a liberal Protestant church in Oklahoma, but I made the mistake of using the word liberal. In Oklahoma, you can be a Democrat or you can be a Christian, <laughs> but, but, but you can't be both. We have more churches than almost anyone, and yet some of the worst social statistics in the country. One in four Oklahoma children face food insecurity. 
That tells you something is really wrong with our whole approach to religion. Democrats hold about 28 of the seats. We are outnumbered. Our ballot box acts a little bit like a time machine. There are no historical errors in the Bible. The Bible's a moving target. If people who say, well, you have to have a Bible in order to be Christian, well, you can't have any Christians until the fourth century. We need as many progressive thinkers in this state as possible. Carlton Pearson straying from the story as it had always been told. The world knows me as bishop, but I don't look like a bishop, so I look like a son of a bishop. That's what they think. <laughs> we started marrying gay people long before it was legal. We were going to fight for laws that treated immigrants as the human beings that they are. The congregation has voted to declare itself to be a sanctuary church. Here we go. I think that All Souls is a part of a new spiritual paradigm right here in the city of Tulsa. Our focus is not to try to save people from a hell in the afterlife that we cannot see, but to save people from very real hells in this life that we can see. I never thought anybody would ever attribute the word heretic to me. Developing an independent way of thinking is dangerous. Be with us as we determine our next faithful step. The interesting thing about people who say they're certain, then you need no faith.
Good morning. In good football form, you have two minutes. Two minute warning before we'll start everything. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. So I now call to order the second general session of the 58th General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association. Are the delegates ready to do the business of the association? Yes, all righty. So please welcome up to this podium members of your right relationship team and safety team. Hello, my name is Yadani Hailu. I am co-chair of Right Relationship Team. And I'm Sherry Halliday Kwan, the other co-chair. This year, we are invited to come alive to the power of we, which begs the communal questions and conversation, who is we? And hopefully, who am I? And do I affect the spaces and communities I'm in? Y'all ready for some realness? Yeah. Okay. Being held accountable, feels like bullying for those who are not used to awareness of their relational impact in society. But it's not. Interpretation of attack 
is the very same evil, the same oppression making its mark, the same lie which whispers to each of us that we're loners or we're supposed to feel shame or small timidness. The invitation when individuals and communities with marginalized and privileged identities call in those with socially privileged identities is for responsibility and compassion for self. When oppression skews our thinking and anxiety moves us to delay change with logistics or heady conversation, we must call a thing a thing and be the antidote within ourselves before we can call a thing a thing and be the antidote outside ourselves. Distracting from the process is not justice making. Yeah. Intellectual conversations which ignore the emotions which fabricate those intellectual understandings and ideas is not liberation. Unity is birthed in being affected by one another and one another's experiences. Liberation is in moving into our discomfort. Vulnerability is facing the shame and fear, knowing they are markers of deeper work, not the landing spot. Courage is in our transparency and the practice of calling a thing a thing within ourselves, too. Like that, the anxiety and confusion in yesterday's general session mirrors anxiety and confusion for many in our churches and communities when talking about white supremacy and oppression. And we must name it as unconscious desire to resist and be dis resist discomfort and the loss of familiarity. Beloveds, please in these moments practice right relationship in yourself. Invite the anxious part of yourself out of dissonance with your, with our shared values. Know that the anxiety is normal, but it serves no one to remain unchecked by ourselves. In other and related right relationship reminders, sighted pedestrians, please be aware the hallways we navigate together are narrow. So please be aware of others around you like folks and scooters by not looking at your phone or program book while walking. Also, let us remember, non-visible disabilities and even non-visible mobility disabilities needs move some of us to use the elevator and ramp. May we each take responsible and compassionate inventory of our needs and utilize the resources we need and extend empathy for our UU siblings who ideally are doing the same. Also, supporting the idea of youth and other intersecting communities is different from the real work of shifting our familiarity or our norms and showing up, our new normal of being present and willing to be transformed. Thank you, may we continue. Good morning, everyone. I'm India Harris, co-chair of the safety team. And I'm Chris Krass, co-chair of the safety team. On Thursday, we had an amazing public witness in which we declared our support of the community of Spokane in stopping the expansion of the Spokane County Jail. We want to extend our gratitude to the community members, organizers, and safety team members that provided excellent programming and care for everyone attending. May, be, may we be reminded in the words, our song, music, of uh, Tasha Cobbs that we are rising up to break every chain. <laughs> may we be, be reminded that the psalmist declares, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from them. As part of the safety team, some of the engagement we've had is with security around disproportionately looking at badges of people of color, young people of color in particular, checking about food, questioning about food, and also about targeting and following. And just to, for those of us who are white, for myself, hearing about some of these things, it can be hard to really contextualize and really deeply understand. So, I mean, just the other day, I made a mistake of really minimizing the impact of being followed by security on people of color, young people of color in particular. And I had to remind myself that we are in the Northwest. 
which was founded on and had laws for a long time, decades long, of a white only region of the country to fulfill the U.S. dream of manifest destiny of a white man's nation. We are living on, we are participating our faith and our work on land in which the law for many, many years was that if a black person remained in this region, they would get six public lashings every day until they left. And this was widely supported in the white community. This was widely supported as the founding of a white nation in this region. And so for me, minimizing the impact of being followed, being targeted, being uh, disproportionately asked to show your proof of being able to be here, I have to, remind, I have to remind myself because that history, that current reality, doesn't live and breathe in my body in the way I experience the interactions here, the space here, the history here. And so for the white folks here, I ask, and I ask myself because I make mistakes all the time, but my commitment is not to try to prove to other people that I'm a good person with good intentions. My commitment is to be somebody who wants to end the nightmare of white supremacy and to believe people of color in their experiences and try to understand the historic and current context in which it's taking place because I don't want to be a good person. I want to be somebody who's part of us getting free. I also, encourage, I also encourage those of us who are white, who don't have the experience of people inappropriately just touching us, grabbing our hair, making comments about how exotic or different or interesting our names are, or our skin is, or our, our clothing, or our style. Youth of color, young people of color in particular have talked about a lot of inappropriate being touched, being looked at, being asked questions about where you're from and your name, and that's so interesting. Things that make people feel exotic, different, are reminding people that you're other in this space. And so asking for folks to be respectful of space and be respectful of what kinds of comments or interesting things you might think are a fun thing to talk about and how it's gonna impact other people in this space. Does that make sense? We're practicing to get free. Every white person in this room needs to remember that white supremacy is whispering words of encouragement to participate in disrespectful and dehumanizing ways to people of color every day. And so it's not enough to say, I'm not racist. We have to say, I am committed to ending white supremacy and doing, making choices every day to participate in liberation rather than unconsciously or consciously enable white supremacy. The safety team is inviting everyone into an engagement with radical imagination in the practices of transformative justice, which address root causes of oppression and strive to address harm without being punitive. Valuing a hollowed understanding of various ideologies instead of the relationships which inform our development and understanding of such ideologies. What has been put forward as, a re as reasonable or objective is still shaped by the particular positionality rooted in dominance and control. This is not an admonishment, this is a reality check. We Unitarian Universalists may, must take responsibility for what we do and say, for freedom of speech has never been free. However, there are many that have not had to account for this, while others have had to account for the assigned and prescriptive identities beyond their control. Transformative justice is future-oriented work that causes us to return to our roots in order to map a way forward. What are we building for those that come after us? When employing a radical imagination, what are we dreaming up, conjuring up for our descendants and shaping into being? We are here. We invite you to embrace this journey, to use your imagination and return to your roots. Thank you. So here we go. We're gonna do a few quick reminders around our rules and process overview. I am also not Denny Davidoff. Barb and I are not Denny. Oh yes, and I talked to Denny this morning. We're also not Denny. And she's like, I ran my, we ran it how we wanted to. So should you all. So just to remind you, we are not Denny or Denny. 
We are Barb and Alandria and Greg and Kathy. And so I'm, we're happy to be us. It's such a great thing. You know, great thing. So a few quick reminders. You must be a delegate to speak at a microphone. And if you do speak, you only have two minutes. And you can only speak once if there's others waiting. In order to make sure that we get through all of our programming today, if you would, please, before approaching the mic, including the procedural mic, consider whether what you are going to offer is a new perspective or a repeat of something offered earlier. We will continue to have like a minute of informal discussion with the countdown timer tracked on the screen by the speaker timer. And this does not count for the 30 minutes. The 30 minutes of debate time does include time devoted to discussing any amendments to the proposed amendment. Amendments must have been submitted for consideration at the appropriate mini-assembly. There has to be 15 minutes of discussion before amendments to the main motion can be considered. There are 30 minutes total again allowed for a bylaw or rule amendments, resolutions, or actions. After 15 minutes of debate, motions to table or refer or in order if that much time is needed. Motions must come from the procedural mic. A motion to call the previous question is in order once 10 minutes has expired and we will do better this today. And there are people at the pro and concern mic. Once five minutes has expired and no one is at the pro or concern mic, then the motion to call the previous question is in order. Time taken at the procedural mic will not count against discussion time, but might count against your lunch. Remember <laughs> that delegates can suspend the rules at any time by going to the procedural mic. There are delegates on, joining us online who will be participating in this debate by submitting type statements and voting via secure polling app. Submitted statements will be read by our volunteer teller team who will be the voice of our off-site delegates and the statements they read do not necessarily reflect their own personal views. Thank you all. So our first order of business will be on voting and elections. Sections 9.9, 9.10, and rules G9.11.1, G9.11.2, and G9.11.3. Do we have a motion? Fantastic. I recognize board member Sarah Dan at the amendment mic. Good morning. I move to adopt this bylaw amendment 9.9, 9.10, 9.11, .9 and rules G9.11.1, G9.11.2, and G9.11.3. These proposed amendments revised the conduct of election sections to normalize electronic voting, both on site and remotely, as used in the 2017 UUA presidential election while preserving the ability to vote by mail. Electronic voting has been an essential tool in expanding voting access and security. There is also clarification of standard voting practices including absentee voting, counting of ballots, and election preparation. Additionally, the amendment provides for ranked choice voting for moderator and presidential elections and revises how electoral ties are determined. Your board strongly endorses this bylaw amendment to make the voting process more effective, efficient, and accessible. Thank you. So we have a motion. I heard a second. All right. One minute for discussion. I recognize the delegate at the con microphone. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Joseph Turner from the Sacramento Congregation. Um, I, um, I, I kind of oppose the rules changes for 9.11.1, 9.11.2 when it comes to resolving ties. Um, I don't believe it's very I mean, uh, stop you one second. This is on me. We need one minute of discussion before we start debate. Oh, okay. So Kathy's going to lead us in that. Okay, so. Um, Turn to your neighbors, um, have a little conversation for about a minute on the amendments. And we're talking about the amendments, not whether or not we do electronic voting. So it's just how we're tweaking the system. 
Okay, one minute on the clock, please. Okay, having had conversation for one minute, we are now ready to um, debate. I recognize the delegate at the offsite delegate at the procedural mic. Thank you. I'm speaking for Sally Jane Gellert, Central Unitarian Church of Paramus, New Jersey. Um, and, and forgive the typing was a little off. Sent to CSW by email this morning, question about line numbers on unincorporated okay, amendments. Excuse me? Um, we're not on the CSW um, issue. We're uh, moving to amend certain sections relating to voting and elections. Thank you. Sally, I hope you'll raise your question again later. I recognize the delegate at the con mic. Oh, hello again. Joseph Turner from Sacramento. Um, the point I was trying to make was I don't find it to be um, very democratic of a process to have draws end in a r random selection. And I kind of like the, the existing language of there being a re a vote with just the delegates who tied, and then that can be, t um, any tied then can be broken by the moderator. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Thank you. Dave Michelle, East Shore Unitarian Universalist, Kirkland, Ohio. Kirtland, Ohio. Since a call the question may occur before any amendment to a motion may be presented, I move that a modification of the rules to set the time for proposal of amendments to the motion to 10 minutes and a motion to call the question to 15 minutes. All right, there's been a motion to suspend the rules. Is there a second? There's a second. I believe this requires a two thirds. Two-thirds, so, what? Sorry. Right, I'm being, uh, as I thought, this is not a debatable motion. So if, um, can the delegate please, can you please restate the uh, proposal? Just so that everybody can um, remind, can be reminded of it, because it'll go very fast when it's being captioned. Slowly reading again, David Michelle, East Shore UU Church, Kirtland, Ohio. Since a call the question may occur before any amendment to a motion may be presented, I move that a modification of the rules to set the time for proposal of amendments to the motion to 10 minutes and a motion to call the question to 15 minutes. Okay, are there any, um, so we're, we're moving to suspend the rules so that um, amendments will be in order a little earlier than is provided for in the draft that you received. All in, it's not a debatable motion. All in favor, raise your um, orange cards. And we'll wait for off-site delegates to vote.
Okay. Okay, all those in the House who are opposed to the motion. Are there abstentions? There are a few. Thank you. Okay, the judgment of the uh, moderator team is that we did not achieve the two-thirds necessary to suspend the rules. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. To me, that looked very close. I request that we count that vote. Okay, the, the request is in order. Are there 100 delegates who would like to have a hand count? And we'll wait for the off-site delegates. We need a count. No, no. Okay, we do not have 100 votes to do a, a hand count, and so we are back on the motion under our current rules. I recognize the delegate at the con mic. Uh, this is Dick Burkhardt, uh, Saltwater UU Church, Des Moines, Washington. I'm also a PhD mathematician, now specializing in the mathematics and computing of voting methods especially methods which rank or rate candidates. I've thoroughly tested and analyzed the instant runoff algorithm used in the uh, section 9.11 and 9.11.2, and also the method described in the unincorporated Amendment A. The Amendment A method, the top three board account, is not only vastly simpler than the instant runoff formula, it's also better suited to nonpartisan elections where you want the best consensus type candidate to be elected. That's why the border method, which assigns points to rankings, is used in SurveyMonkey and a wide variety of other situations to get preferred options. For example, in a three-way race under instant runoff, the candidate with the smallest following cannot possibly win. They get eliminated first. But for the border count, if, if that candidate gets a sufficient number of second place rankings from the other candidates, they can actually win. This gives you a real possibility of a uh, compromised candidate being elected. That's one reason why you have a more consensus type feel as well as simplicity. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Uh, yes, there being no speakers at either the pro or the con mic, I would like to make the motion to call the question. I need to be advised as to whether or not we've had five minutes of debate. The motion and the amendment clocks aren't agreeing. Not five yet? Um, okay, according to our rules, we still have to wait a couple of minutes. Thank you for your motion. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. It doesn't seem fair to have a, a, a motion to limit debate before um, offering a person a chance to make a, a, the unincorporated amendment, which is in order in this case. I understand uh, the rules allow for that motion when five minutes has um, expired and there is nobody at either the con or the pro mic. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Uh, mo motion to suspend the rules. Your name and oh, I your... apologize. Yeah. Carl Ponen in Unitarian Universalist Church of Greater Lansing. Uh, motion to suspend the rules just um, to allow the unincorporated amendment to be proposed since we have nothing else going on with this debate right now. Do we need more
Okay, uh, that, your motion's not specific enough to be acted on. Um, are the delegates ready to vote? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, we have already, I, I recognize a delegate at the amendment mic. Yeah, again, uh, Dick Burkhardt, Saltwater New York Church in Des Moines, Washington. Uh, I'm the one that made the uh, unincorporated amendment A. Uh, I'll start by reading that amendment. Uh, first, I'd like to know that, to note that lines 246 to 273 were the correct lines in the original, in the program book, and the handout, the yeah. corresponding lines are okay. two, two, um, 249. A motion to amend is not in order because 15 minutes has not expired, and we did Fine. not suspend the rules previously. I thought it was. No. I thought it was the question uh, is whether or not we want to call the question, which is in order after we've had five minutes of discussion on the motion and nobody being at either the con or the pro mic, which was the case at least a couple of minutes ago. Um, we had a motion earlier to suspend the rules to move things up so amendments could be offered earlier, and that was overwhelmingly rejected by the body. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Thank you. Can you hear us? There we go. Sally Jane Geller, Central Unitarian Church, Paramus, New Jersey. Point of information. My understanding is that the unincorporated amendments completely replace section 9.11 and rule G 9.11.2 tie vote, ranked voting uh, bracket moderator, respectively, correct? The line numbers on sheets numbered one and two on which the unincorporated amendments appear to have different line numbers that were used to identify placement of the two amendments. For instance, line 246, which is given as the start of the first unincorporated amendment, neither starts nor ends a sentence. In line 273, the purported closing is the same in an entirely different section. Okay. For the purpose of answering that question, I will recognize the proposer for the purpose of providing information only. Yeah, um, the unincorporated amendment was put together at the mini assembly referring to the lines in the program book. The lines that, the corresponding lines in your handout are different. So in the handout, the corresponding lines are 222 to 249 instead of 246 to 273. And for the second amendment, the lines are 271 to 280 instead of 285 to 293. Okay, so you are replacing the proposed language relating to ties with a different system. Is that correct? Yeah, correct? Thank you for the answer. I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. It is my understanding that if I speak for two minutes, that we can get to a motion to uh, call the question. Yeah. We're there so, now. We are there now, okay. Okay, I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Thank you. The first one is from Christine Hager, River Road UU Congregation in Bethesda, Maryland. Yeah. Calling the question requires a two-thirds vote on calling the question. That's then, correct. Sorry? That's correct. Then a vote on the original motion. That's correct. If rules say five minutes, then as soon as the five minutes are up, calling the previous question requires no second but the vote. Thank you. Genevieve O'Malley Knight, Hopedale UU Community, Oxford, Ohio. Like yeah. Point of personal privilege. The off-site delegates are not being heard on all issues. This is relevant to all subjects. Will the chair please hear the entire comment from off-site delegates before ruling it out of order? When we have small typos at the beginning of our comments, we are shut down. We have no way to say, oops, what I meant to say was, please hear the entire comment before, before ruling it out of order. Thank you. And I've got one more. Suzanne Royer, Towson UU Church, Lutherville, Maryland. How can we call the question when the unincorporated amendment passed in the mini assembly and has not been allowed to be re, excuse me, be introduced due to the rules? Okay, let me uh, explain that it did not pass in the mini assembly. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Thank you. Uh, Dean Rudy, Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Church, 
Do I understand that now a motion to call the question is in order? One more minute. We have a, mi no, we have a minute and, if it, and 40. A little under two minutes. And if it's not in order, is it in order to move to suspend the rules to call the question, which would require a two-thirds vote? Um, it would be, although we just, we, we did have that discussion. Um, would you like to make a motion to suspend the rules? I move to suspend the rules to allow a motion to call the question to be considered. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay, there is a second. It's a non-debatable motion. All those in favor of uh, moving to suspend the rules to allow uh, the debate to be closed now, please raise your voting cards. We'll wait to hear from our off-site delegates. Please keep your cards up. Okay, thank you. You can put your cards down. All opposed. Any please put your cards down. Are there any abstentions? There are some. Thank you very much. Let's uh, confer. All right, the consensus of the moderator team is that we have two thirds to suspend the rules to allow um, closing debate um, before the five minutes is up. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Oh, but we have to vote. Okay, we have to move immediately to a vote. My apologies. So all those in favor of the proposed amendment as written without the unincorporated amendment, please raise your voting cards. Oh, I need a motion to call the question. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. now, now it's allowed. Yeah, at the procedural mic, please. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. We need a motion to call, we need a motion to call the question. This is, this is not really clear. If we call the question, it's not debate, then it would be in order to vote on the unincorporated amendment. No. Why not? We it move does, to, to, to suspend the rules. Isn't that the way it's supposed to work? It, we move to suspend the rules so that we could close the question now rather than waiting until five minutes is up. So now a motion to call the question is in order. If that passes, then we will move immediately to a vote on the amendments of the election section. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Tim Murphy, UU Church of Indianapolis, Indiana. And I would just like to remind delegates and other folks who are asked to come to the microphone to always say their name and their congregation or position. We really appreciate having that information and to encourage the moderators to hold us to that. Thank, Thank you, you very much. We've been trying to do that. I recognize the del offsite delegate at the procedural mic. Suzanne Royer, Towson UU Church, Lutherville, Maryland. I disagree with the moderator's statement that the unincorporated amendment did not pass in many assembly. It passed a straw poll so that it could be brought to general session. Okay, um, the person who made the motion to call the, uh, suspend the rules, could you come to the procedural mic and make your motion? Thank you, Madam Moderator. Dino Drudy, Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Church, Bethesda, Maryland. I move to call the question. A motion has been made. Is there a second? All in favor of stopping debate so we can proceed to a motion on the main uh, question. Please raise your voting cards. And we'll wait for our off-site delegates to vote. Please put your cards down. All those opposed to um, stopping debate. 
and we'll wait for our off-site delegates. Thank you, put your cards down. Are there any abstentions? Okay, the motion to close debate has passed. We will now proceed immediately to a vote on the motion to amend the bylaws relating to elections. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Moderator Bjork, my name is Denise Rimes. I'm a member of First UU Church in Richmond, Virginia, and a member of our UUA Board of Trustees. I implore all delegates to remember what your mother taught you about budding in line. Please be aware of the people who are in front of you who have been waiting to make their statements. I understand the need, the sense of urgency and passion, but I beg you in the spirit of covenant and right relationship, please line up nicely. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. We are now ready to vote. All those in favor of the proposed amendments to bylaws relating to elections, please raise your voting cards. What's that? Repeated. Okay, we are moving to amend section 9.11 of the bylaws and rules G 9.11.1 and Rule G 9.11.2 and Rule G 9.11.3, as uh, listed in your program book. Okay, please keep the cards up. I know your hands get tired. I don't think inflatable palm trees count as an appropriate voting card. <laughs> okay, thank you. Please put your cards down. All opposed, please raise your cards. Okay, and any abstentions? Okay, thank you. The motion passes. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Thank you. Christine Hager, River Road UU Congregation, Bethesda, Maryland. Move to count votes needs two thirds. Thank you. Oh, no, our rules say 100. We don't, again, as we explained yesterday, um, Robert's rules are not necessarily the way we operate every single thing. This body adopts rules that differ in some respects. But thank you, Christine, for your comments, and thanks to everybody who has uh, offered to provide the moderator advice on parliamentary procedure. I really do, I really sincerely do appreciate it. Thank you. having some fun at that procedural queue this morning, aren't we? It stops the clock, but again, as uh, moderator Landra explained, it takes time off your lunch. It does take time off of your lunch. All right, so we are ready to handle the, let me just make sure that I have the right thing in front of me. There we go. All right. Yes, I got it. Thank you, Moderator Landry. All right, so we are about to discuss uh, the proposed bylaw amendment to section 11.3 that talks about the length of time for preliminary fellowship. And to that end, I recognize the trustee at the amendment mic. On behalf, on behalf of our board of trustees, is this on? On behalf of our board of trustees, I move that we consider and adopt the amendment to bylaw section 11.3 related to preliminary Fellowship. The proposed amendment supports Commission on Institutional Change collaboratory recommendations that take the amount of time that one can be in preliminary fellowship out of the UUA bylaws, thereby giving the Ministerial Fellowship Committee the ability to determine policy on this matter. This change would give the Ministerial Fellowship Committee greater flexibility in meeting case-by-case -case situations, allowing for the possibility of granting 
more time in preliminary fellowship to individuals who may need it for life circumstance reasons. Your board endorses and supports the adoption of this bylaw amendment. The motion has been made to change the timeline of preliminary fellowship. Is there a second? All right. Is there any discussion? We're going to move into one minute of discussion. You're going to hear a chime at the end of that. So turn to a neighbor. Maybe even just stretch, have a conversation with your body. Your time begins now. Alrighty, everybody. So there's an offsite delegate at the procedural mic. Nope. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. James Williams, Unitarian. Uh, hold on one second. I can't hear you. Now I can hear you. James Williams, Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Morgantown, West Virginia. For a point of personal privilege. I would really appreciate it if in the future when we publish amendments with numbered lines that we keep one consistent set and not have different sets floating around that causes me a lot of angst and I suppose it bothers other people as well. Thank you. I recognize a delegate at the pro mic. Leslie, Ta Leslie Takahashi. Hold on one second. Leslie right Takahashi, delegate from Mount Diablo Unitarian Universalist Church. Yeah. Um, in Walnut Creek, California. Um, I just want to say briefly that this, um, this is an important amendment that um, recognizes that not every person who comes into our ministry has equal resources. Some people have to work, that takes them longer, and we don't want an arbitrary deadline to keep people who have worked hard to enter into our leadership. Thank you. I recognize a delegate at the pro mic. Linda Susan Ulrich, the Assistant Minister in Ann Arbor. And I also want to speak in favor of this because if life circumstances happen where one has to take care of a child who is ill or maybe a parent who is dying or can only find um, a patchwork of, of work, uh, it, all of those things are out of you know, the minister's control. And I would not want us to trade our humanity in taking care of our loved ones for an arbitrary deadline. Thank you. I recognize the delegate of the procedural mic. Thank you. Erin White, Fourth Universalist, New York City. Um, I have a question, which is that I, in my reading of the current uh, bylaw, is that it's a requirement of at least three years, which seems to me that there's the ability for someone to. Um, take longer than three years. And so I guess it's just kind of question to if that's understanding is correct um, of the current. So maybe somebody from the pro can answer that. I don't know. Uh, I would appreciate it greatly. Thank you. Matthew, do you want to answer the question? Or Manish? Our, un is the mic on? Our, under our understanding as the board, is this mic on? Hold on. Our understanding, I should, let me just oh. I recognize it. Okay, can you stay at the amendment mic, Manish? I recognize the delegate of the. Oh, hold on. I recognize the delegate of the amendment mic. Manish Mishra Marzetti, uh, first Unitarian Universalist Ann Arbor, but and also a member of our UUA Board of Trustees. In our conversations, as the board has proposed this amendment, we understand 
that uh, it's intended to create flexibility in both directions. So there may be occasions when more time is needed in preliminary fellowship, and there may be occasions when less time, less than three years is needed. So this takes it any time specification out of the bylaws and allows the committee that has jurisdiction over this matter to make the decision um, as to what the policies will be for what situations. I recognize a delegate of the procedural mic. Thank you. I'm speaking for Sally Jane Gellert, Central Unitarian Church of Paramus, New Jersey. Question about arbitrary deadline, that's in quotes. Does the MFC have authority as it is to amend those deadlines and how does changing to complete flexibility allow for understanding of a formal process? So the delegate the pro mic, there's somebody behind you that could answer the question. Would you like them to answer or do you want to talk? I think she was in line and she should go first. Great, I recognize the delegate the pro mic. Hi, my name is Franny House from the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Klamath County in sunny Klamath Falls, Oregon. And I'm here, my speaker time, oh, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna speak for two minutes so that we can get to five minutes of discussion. I'm taking my whole two minutes. Let me tell you a story about why this amendment is important. I'm the advisor for the Magic the Gathering Club at Oregon Institute of Technology. Magic players in the house. So we are a, an official student organization, and when I helped my students found this club, we adopted the sample constitution given to us by the former director of student affairs without actually reading it carefully. And let me tell you, having overly specific rules in the official set of rules that governs your organization is really inconvenient when you later realize you have to hold elections and your officers have to serve certain amounts of time. Um, so having a very specific number of years in our bylaws related to something that shouldn't be governed by the bylaws seems like a problem. Who thinks that's a problem? Am I allowed to do that? You, you just did it. Great. <laughs> Magic the Gathering is a highly rules-based game. It is potentially the most complex game known to humanity. There's been some computer science research on this recently. Uh, so, you know, we know rules, uh, and if, uh, if this experience has taught me that overly specific rules are not important, I think that we should vote to remove this rule and make it more flexible so that the appropriate people can make the decision about of the length of time people should be serving in preliminary fellowship instead of our lovely bylaws. 20 more seconds. This is my first GA. Thanks to everyone for welcoming me. Any left after what? Five seconds? All right. Thanks, everybody. I recognize the delegate of the pro mic. I'm Matthew Johnson at Rock, in Rockford, Illinois. Um, not nearly as entertaining. I saw this on the final agenda a while ago and was super curious about what this was about. The typical picture in our mind is that a minister graduates from seminary, gets a job in a congregation, works three years at least half time, and each year goes well, and the fellowship committee renews them. So what was this about? So I went to the mini-assembly, I asked my colleagues and friends and heard stories, some of like you just heard, about the minister who works in a community setting, has a difficult pregnancy, and is fired from their job. That would delay their ability to enter what we're now calling full fellowship. A minister who is on disability and cannot work more than a certain number of hours uh, without losing necessary benefits and supports, that could delay or even prevent them from achieving full fellowship under our current rules. So I was persuaded by those stories that this is a rule that we should trust the ministerial fellowship committee and the UA board to design and that we need not keep in our bylaws. So I'd urge the delegates to uh, vote yes. Most of you don't know about the intricacies. Um, I think I'm pretty aware of them and was persuaded by the people in charge this made a lot of sense based on people's real lives. So I hope you vote yes. I recognize the delegate of the procedural mic. I'm Laura Anderson from the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Charlotte County. I don't understand Magic the Gathering, but I believe I can call the question on this. I need it. Hmm? We have 21 more seconds. 
And <laughs> Go ahead. I recognize that I'll get the pro mic. I'm reading for Ami Yoon, West Shore UU Church, Cleveland, Ohio. As someone who has done graduate school with physical disabilities in another field, I strongly favor this, as I believe it will help increase diversity of life experience and make becoming a full minister of our faith more possible for our lay ministers with disabilities. Call the question. Come on back. Nope. Oh, do you have something you want to say? Yeah. I recognize the leg of the procedural mic. Hans Kelsen, Unitarian Universalist Church of Bloomington, Indiana. Um, I don't believe we can call the question yet because there are still delegates at the pro and con mics. So he's, this is a teller. Oh, I'm sorry. And this is a teller. Never mind. <laughs> I'm leaving now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know we all like to have, yes, we like to talk. Go ahead. I'm still Laura Anderson. I'm still from Florida. I'd still like to call the question. Do we have a second? Okay, all those in favor? <laughs> and it requires two thirds majority. Thank you. All those opposed? Wow. Abstentions? We did a thing. <laughs> oh, goodness. Here we go. Okay. Now we're voting on the actual thing. <laughs> Section 11.3, admission to fellowship. All those in favor, please raise your voting cards. I love Robert Sills of Order. Not. <laughs> We're waiting on off-site. All righty, thank you. All those opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, we did another thing. All right, dear ones, we're ready to move on to our statement of conscience. Statement of conscience is a little bit of a different process because it has a higher threshold of the thing we're trying to create. These are things that we use to advocate for our faith in the wider world, so we want to make sure that we give enough time for discernment. You should know that in order to have a proposed statement of conscience, we've already gone through a three-year process where very wise people that you all elected looked at all the feedback that your congregations gave them and created programs. So we have to have 40 minutes on the clock for this one. We have to discuss for at least 15 minutes, and no amendments are in order until at least 15 minutes have passed, if that much time is needed. All right, I'm going to go ahead and recognize the commissioner at the amendment mic. Oh, he's up here. Come on. Will the commissioner make the appropriate motion? I'm the Reverend Meredith Garman, serving our congregation in White Plains, New York, and a commissioner on the Commission on Social Witness. The Commission on Social Witness moves that the 2019 General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association adopt the statement of conscience entitled Democracy Uncorrupted as revised and distributed through yesterday's CSW alert and available on the General Assembly app. A motion has been made to accept the proposed statement of conscience. Is there a second? All right, let's go ahead and have one minute of discussion with your neighbors. You'll hear a chime when your time is up.
Okay, let's come on back. There is a question that I've previously reviewed uh, in the off-site procedural queue. So I would like a commissioner to come to the amendment mic so that we're able to answer that question. Can I get someone on the Commission on Social Witness to a mic so that we can answer this question quickly once it's asked? I recognize the delegate at the off-site procedural mic. Rebecca Berger, UU Congregation of Wyoming Valley in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Is line 159 in the revised SOC correct? Is it supposed to say overturning corporate constitutional rights instead of overturning constitutional rights? Um, or, All right, I recognize the commissioner at the um, amendment, Mike. It, it is a typo. We have corrected it on the version that's going to the tech deck. So it should, we, are, we don't want to overturn constitutional rights, we want to overturn corporate constitutional rights. Right. Everyone understand there is a typo in your printed copy, but when we get the text up on the screen and you can see our uh, windows up there, we're going to get up the correct version there. So let's not worry about that too much. I need to have a consult with one of the moderator team. Give me just a second. Right, we're, we're gonna we're gonna play the memory game. So I'm Greg. I'm part of your moderator team. That's Kathy. She's also part of your moderator team. Alandria introduced us this morning. We've both been serving on your board of trustees for a long time. Our pictures are everywhere. We've been moderating some of the assembly since 2017 in New Orleans. I find it curious that we were not remembered. And I, I, honestly, no, I, I, want you, I want you to sit with that. How many black men have you actually seen on this stage? Remember me. Remember my face. Remember Kathy. Remember her face. I recognize the, dele I, I recognize the delegate at the procedural make. Hi, Rachel Murphy from Boise Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. Uh, could someone direct us to where we can find the revisions on the app? Certainly. I'm just going to confer with the commission. Is the correct copy on the app? Yes. If you go to um, where it has more on the app at the bottom, and then you go to business, and then you'll see CSW Alert Friday, and that's the, that's the revision that's also in the paper version. Right. So we'll, it will just navigate the app. At the bottom of your screen, you see three lines that say more. Click on that. You'll see business. It has a gavel or a hammer. Click on that. Then you'll see a text that says CSW Alert Friday PDF. Click on that. All right. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Good morning. Orlando Montoya, Unitarian Universalist Church of Savannah, Georgia. May I ask the moderator when uh, he, the, the moderator asked the person over there, the CSW, to please speak at the Pro mic, because when they're speaking at the amendment mic, the clock is not counting uh, for the debate. Correct, and that is true. Whenever the commission or the board are answering simple questions or uh, speaking in favor, they are supposed to speak from the amendment mic so that it does not count against the time. That's what our rules say. Okay. I recognize the delegate at the concern mic. Bob Gerke from uh, Pocatello, Idaho. The uh Pocatello Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. I'm expressing a concern. I'm not opposed to the entire statement, but uh, under uh, individuals can take actions such as follows. Eliminating the electoral college is really shifting the votes to the two coasts and kind of cutting out the middle section of the country. I don't think that's a good idea. It certainly will support our beliefs, but I don't think that it, it will, it will flip-flop the, the vote. Thank you. All right, just checking off-site. I'm not seeing anyone at any of the mics. Someone is, don't run, don't run, it's all right, I'll wait for you, I can see you. 
we have someone approaching the pro mic. So we'll just wait for that person because I can see that person approaching. Take a breath. Thank you, Gregory. So my name is Carla Gates. I'm from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Columbia, Maryland, and I am the incoming board president. A congregational president, excuse me. <laughs> so um, I'm very thrilled personally that we have such a statement of conscience, making sure I use the right terms, um, and, and, and that we are proposing this. I um, think it's actually very important to end the Electoral College um, as it has disenfranchised, um, well, African American and Latinx folks, and it has overfranchised um, people in less populated areas. Um, and unfortunately, the history of the Electoral College was that it was created um, in order to purposefully rebalance things um, as the slaves were becoming free. Um, so I just wanted to support, and for those who don't know, this is line 182 well, 182 to 183, um, about support efforts to end the Electoral College. And in the interim, urge states to allocate electoral votes to the presidential candidate who won the popular vote. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. There, there's a bit of a consult at the procedural mic. You've spoken many times. Before I call on another man, or a white person at the procedural mic, I want to make sure you've talked to other people first and to make sure that yours is the voice that needs to be heard. So go and talk to three other people. And once the usher verifies that that has happened, we'll welcome you back, but you've spoken a lot, okay? Is there anyone at the con mic? Yes. All right, I recognize the delegate at the concern mic. Thank you. My name is Mary Wilson from the Bismarck Van Den Unitarian Universalist Congregation and Fellowship. I also live in the lands of the Ocheti Shakoi um, and Nuita, Hidatsa, and Sanish. Um, my concerns regarding this measure is this statement is that I don't feel like the um, perspectives or experience of indigenous people have been recognized or acknowledged or the colonial, colonial roots of democracy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Um, hi, my name is Tatum Ken. I'm from the Skagit Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Mount Vernon, Washington. And um, this is just in regards to the Electoral College. I don't think it's that radical of an opinion that every person should have an equal vote. That's it. Thank you. I recognize the delegate um, at the on-site con mic. No, he was just holding a space for me. Oh, are, are you the off-site delegate? I'm an on-site delegate. Right, that's, I'm recognizing you. Oh, I thought you said off-site, sorry. I'm Cynthia Landrum then, um, from the uh, First Parish Church of Stowe and Acton in Stowe, Massachusetts. I um, rise to the con microphone today because I feel like we should hear more voices rather than more procedures. And I, in particular, recognize that we haven't heard the voices of youth today. Um, and so that's why I'm standing here at the con microphone. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing some uh, commotion from the youth caucus section. I think they're saying that youth can speak for themselves. And uh, youth caucus, I, I trust that if you have something to say, you'll approach one of the mics. Yeah! Did everyone hear the youth caucus? Yeah! Awesome. <laughs> All right, I recognize the delegate at the off-site con mic. Thank you. I speak for Sally Jane Gellert, Central Unitarian Church of Paramus, New Jersey. I agree that there is a big issue with the Electoral College, 
but I would prefer to encourage states to split their EC, presumably electoral college, votes according to the actual vote within their state so that candidates are encouraged to no longer ignore smaller states to focus only on the most populous, knowing that they are winner-take-all states. Thank you. Very well. I, I have confirmed with the usher that the delegate has talked to three additional people. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, first, there's a small item of personal privilege. Uh, Can you say your name, please? I am Dino Drudy, uh, Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Church in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, <clears throat> the UUA has much better race definitions than the federal government does. And under those race definitions, because my maternal grandparents are from Lebanon, I am a minority, not a white person. So thank you. Um, but my question applies to my question applies to what is now line 140, uh, reinstating the 1965 Voting Rights Act provisions. I think this is talking about the provisions which, on a five to four vote, the Supreme Court found were unconstitutional. I am curious as to how the Commission on Social Witness believes. Uh, these items may be reinstated without amending the Constitution, which is what's mentioned in the next line. Can you ask just the question part of that again? I am curious as to how the provisions of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which the Supreme Court has ruled unconstitutional, can be re reinstated and how the Commission on Social Witness believes that that can be done without amending the Constitution. Let's see. I think that is beyond the scope of this document, but I'm going to ask you to go huddle with the commissioners, and maybe they can satisfy your curiosity. And when you have an answer that seems to work for all of you, we'll, we'll bring that before the assembly. Will that work? Thank you. Okay. Uh, where are they? They're right over here, uh, to my left, to your right. I recognize the delegate at the off-site procedural mic. Thank you. Speaking for Fred Hammond, excuse me, Fred L. Hammond, Manatee UU Fellowship in Bradenton, Florida. A point of clarification. In the revised document, there are sections that are highlighted in yellow. What does this highlight mean? For example, lines 133 and 134. I'm believing it's just that they were highlighted and then printed out that way, uh, but I will need a commissioner to speak about that. Can we get the text back on the screen as well? I want to make sure that... Can we see the text of the proposed statement of conscience on the screen? There we go. All right. I recognize the commissioner at the amendment mic. Uh, that highlight being the only highlight is inadvertent. It's inadvertent. That's what I thought. Okay, there we go. Uh, all right, I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Reverend Amy Williams Clark. Well, wow. <laughs> Amy Williams Clark. I'm the minister at Cedar Hurst Unitarian Universalist. And uh, I have a question. Um, and it is regarding um, the statement of Khan earlier. It's a very, it's, I support the. Um, the, the ways in which we have, I do not support the ways that we have uh, ignored the voices of indigenous people. So I'm, uh, I'm hearing. I'm sorry, my yes, question is if we pass this, if we do not pass this, um, can we, can we amend, it, amend it or do we go straight back to study again? We would go straight back to study that the options right now are to incorporate the unincorporated amendments once we, about eight more minutes have passed, uh, that would be in order, um, or to get rid of it. Because again, this has already gone through a three-year yeah. study process. It's gotten a lot of um, feedback. And so making those types of substantial amendments at this late stage are, you know, it sets us back over. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and recognize the, dele ah, the delegate at the pro mic. I don't like that word today. <laughs> I'll try to make it as easy on you as possible. My name is Sarah Wade Smith. I am a trustee at Allegheny Unitarian Universalist Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I am speaking in support of this statement of conscience. I want to acquaint you all with some history. In my native state of Tennessee, in 1796, if you wanted to vote for your congressman, you needed to own land worth at least $100, which was a year's salary in those days. If you, and you had to be male. Women did not receive the right to vote in this country until, in most cases, 1920. And that was after 78 years of struggle to achieve that right. If you wanted to vote for a member of the state, legis state Senate, you needed to own land worth $500. If you wanted to vote for a United States Senator, you needed to be elected to the state legislature because direct election of senators instead of election by state legislatures did not happen until the early 20th century. And if you wanted to vote for president, you had to get the state legislature to select you as one of the state's electors. We are now, democracy has been an evolving project in this country. It has taken us almost 200 years to get as close as we are to one person, one vote. And we are now facing an organized movement that wants to roll voting rights back to eliminate the rights of the most economically insecure and marginalized of our people to participate in government and their own destiny. We need to take a stand against this. This statement of, statement of conscience does that, and we should support it. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the off-site delegate at the procedural mic. Thank you, you got it before I did. <laughs> <laughs> Sally Jane Gellert, Central Unitarian Church, Paramus, New Jersey. Mr. Boyd, very respectfully, respectively, I ask you to frame the questions and procedures more neutrally. I will do my best. I recognize the delegate at the concern mic. Hi, Parrish Turner of First Unitarian of Brooklyn. I have a concern about line uh, and the change that was made uh, in the amendments and for line 55, specifically around um, cisgender and heterosexuals over LGBTQ+. Um, I have a grammatic concern, but I think it affects the meaning of the sentence. In particular, the word cisgender is an adjective, while the word heterosexuals is a noun. So it should either be cisgender people and heterosexuals or cisgender heterosexuals. And I do think the difference between those is important. I'm not sure if this is a concern that might should be made on the amendment but or where the, to direct this to. Okay, so here's how we're gonna handle this one. Wait just a second. So this is something that the commission already incorporated. Mm -hmm. And does this assembly believe that changing a word from a noun to an adjective to conform to the meaning of the sentence is something that we should take as an amendment. So I'm gonna ask you very carefully, we're gonna do a straw poll on this. If we have to change from heterosexuals to heterosexual or to make the meaning of that sentence, I'm gonna read it out loud to you. The nation's founding documents expressed inspiring ideals of democratic equality Unequal valuation, however, has undermined our country's prospects for living the promise of true democracy. White people are valued more than people of color, men more than women, the rich more than the poor, cisgender and heterosexual people over LGBTQ plus people. I believe that is the intent of that statement. The commission is confirming that that is the intent of that statement. If we remove that S, so that becomes an adjective, heterosexual becomes an adjective. Would everyone be okay with that? If you are okay with that, go ahead and raise your orange voting cards. You're gonna wait for the offsite. Again, the palm tree can't vote. All right, go ahead and lower those. 
any opposition to making that conforming change to make sure that everything is an adjective instead of a noun. Anyone opposed to that here in the hall? Any abstentions? Okay, so we've taken care of that. Thank you. I recognize the off-site delegate at the procedural mic. Same person, okay, that clear, cue is cleared. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Uh, thank you. Uh, Carl Pononen, UU Church of Greater Lansing. Uh, my memory is that in past debates on, um, uh, what, are we, what are we talking about here? <laughs> in, in past debates on these, these types of issues, uh, strictly grammatical changes, we didn't need to discuss. Those could just be handled by the CSW without a discussion or, or a straw vote. Um, would, would, that, would that make all of our discussions much easier? Yeah, it would definitely make all of our discussions much easier. In this case, we weren't actually clear because that sentence as written meant something substantially different uh, than what was intended. All right, I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Thank you so much. Peter Candace, Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Low Country in Bluffton, South Carolina. Um, I'm, I'm very sensitive to the concept of the tyranny of the majority, and I would just like to remind the assembled delegates that our senators are elected two per state regardless of the population of that state, and so I believe that we have a good protection in that respect for guarding against the tyranny of the majority uh, as concerns the Electoral College. Thank you very much. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the concern mic. Uh, the, uh, I'm Judy Wright, uh, UUCLV of uh, Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. Uh, the, uh, we have to be careful in uh, amending corporation, corporate values because we could easily also give others the right to amend union and non-NGO rights. Uh, the other thing that concerns me is that anger, the reason Trump got elected was anger, and that uh, the Greeks, the original Greek concept was of, uh, of there would be the citizens, but there would also be philosopher kings, and these would be people who would know the whole situation and be able to say, gee, that person is not right. And so possibly some system where the electoral college has a way of joining a, a statement, uh, you know, if a certain number join a statement saying this guy is about to go crazy or about to die from a heart attack, that he shouldn't be in office. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Hello, my name is Joss McCall, and I am from the great state of Texas, <laughs> representing the Unitarian Fellowship of Houston. And as um, a delegate, I remind us all that y'all means all. So as we're representing everybody, we need to realize that, dem uh, d that democracy as a whole represents every single person and every single vote. And whenever we have a, uh, whenever we have a body that we did not elect that does not represent us properly, it kind of is hypocrisy. We don't elect the people in the electoral in the electoral college. We don't elect these people. They can change their vote on a whim, and if we do not get rid of it, it will already be it will basically become archaic because the states are slowly getting rid of the Electoral College and saying we are going to throw our votes to the popular vote or we're going to divide them. So if we don't get rid of it, the states will slowly get rid of it and then it will become archaic. So either way, either way in a, in a moment of beloved community, let us realize that these lines may mean many different things, but together it is, we are one. We are a democracy in, in action. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the concern mic. Hi, my name is Ben. Oh, move closer. All right, my name is Ben and Bella Rosenzweig. I'm the religious educator at First Unitarian Church of St. Louis. I just want to say that I, um, I really appreciate this statement um, and I re respect the amount of time that has gone into this. 
Um, I know I will, I will vote in its passing. Um, I want, and I also want to say that I, I agree with one of the delegates beyond, uh, before me that said that this does not represent indigenous peoples enough. Um, but under actions that we could take, and I, I, will, I will step down immediately if, um, if I've missed this, I've not seen the word reparations in, in this, and if, if someone can point me to that, that would be great, but I represent, I represent an organization in St. Louis that's, in, that's nationally, that's called the Black Power Blueprint, and that is it. It's working class black communities in the ghetto that was created by the white government of, of St. Louis, and it's through redlining, and that's, anyway, the point being is that words have power, and if we acknowledge that we live in a white supremacist culture with white supremacy institutions that includes wealth, and that all, that all, that includes all wealth, that people make and their wealth that contributes to these organ, to organizations and to institutions, including the Unitarian Universalist congregations. That means that all money has some part in white supremacist uh, activity. And that under actions that we could take, we really should be point putting under everything individuals, congregations, clusters, the UUA, that we owe reparations. Thank you. That is, that is not part of this statement of conscience. This is not the only way we have to advocate for our values and live them out in society. I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. I'm James Williams from the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Morgantown, West Virginia. There was an earlier question posed, perhaps at the procedural mic, that seemed really to have, should have been at the con mic and should have occurred in order. In any event, the question was, how can we possibly change the Supreme Court decision about the Voting Rights Act without passing a constitutional amendment? The answer is, you simply write a Voting Rights Act change that meets the problems pointed out by the, civil, by the Supreme Court. It's not a requirement to, to do that. Many times legislation is passed that fails the Supreme Court, but when rewritten, passes. Thank you. I recognize the off-site delegate at the procedural mic. Thank you. Sally Jane Geller, Central Unitarian Church, Paramus, New Jersey. Move Amendment 1. Line 36, because in our current political social climate, freedom from religion is less recognized than it has been in the past. Okay, um, tech deck, I wanna need your help over here or whoever's uh, creating my tablet. I need an amendment column as well so I know where in the procedural queue we're gonna do things. 15 minutes of time have expired, so amendments are now in order, but we take amendments separately from the way we take other procedures. Does that make sense to everyone? So I want all of the amendments to come from the amendments mic, not from the procedure mic. So I need to be able to see if someone has an amendment as opposed to uh, a point of information or a point of personal privilege. Do we understand that over there? Is that possible to do? You want me to move? Okay. Give, give me just a second. This, this is an order, so I just want to make sure that we're, we're moving the right way. Turn to a neighbor. Discuss which democratic value is most important to you. Your time begins now. Thank <laughs> you. 
but he was saying that I, you know, now we're for, for amendments. I had an amendment, but, you know, I would love to hear from you about this. With, with 45 of them. Let's come on back. In three, two, one, and a hush fell over the hall. Okay, so we are gonna let this play out and we are still gonna do the themed conversation today. Okay, so just remember, there are two things that have to happen this morning, thank you. Okay, so what we're doing right now, the amendment is in order. The way we normally take uh, unincorporated amendments on a statement of conscience is in alphabetical order, because we have a lot of them. The unincorporated amendments go out to double I. So it is a lot easier if we take them alphabetically. I am allowing the commission and some of the ushers on the floor to arrange the amendments in the appropriate order so that it's easier for us to move through those. Does that make sense? While they're doing that, I'm going to acknowledge the delegation at the pro mic. And my instruction to the delegate representing the delegation is that while no speaker may speak for longer than two minutes, our rules are silent on how long delegations may speak. Don't rush. I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Hello, my name is Julia Landis, and I am a delegate from the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Church Unitarian Universalist. I am the senior business manager, and I am representing the Youth Caucus with support from YA at GA. Unitarian Universalists are called to ensure that democracy has free access to all who want it, both in and outside the denomination, in our fifth principle that calls us to believe in our ideas and act on them. This statement forces our UUA to reflect and look back on this principle and guide our congregation's actions. With this upcoming presidential election in 2020, we have to ensure that all voices will be able to be heard. By adopting this statement of conscience, the UUA and its respective covenantal communities will be committed to restoring voter rights to disenfranchised people. We urge you to all vote in favor of this statement of conscience because we have to UU the vote. It looks like the delegation has finished speaking. Thank you, Youth Caucus, with support from YA at GA. All right, I'm going to just check in with my amendment mic. Do we have the amendments alphabetized at this point? Okay, we're good. All right, so let's go ahead and move the first amendment in alphabetical order. Amendments are in order at this point. One has already been moved. We're just gonna take them in alphabetical order. So I was taking that pro statement to give us some time. I recognize the delegate at the <coughs> amendment mic. Um, my name is Kendra Munts, and I am a member of the UU Congregation of Venice, Florida, and president of the UU Justice Florida State Action Network. Um, I am proposing we incorporate the unincorporated amendment A at line, um, encourage leaders of the UUA and other faiths to join the Interfaith Caucus of Move to Amend, giving the, the link to the website there, and adding that at a comma after we, de we demand democracy.org at line 194. The reason is that we, the, we demand democracy, encouraging 
encouraging the UUA to, quote, participate, line number 194, to participate in the democracy supporting movements such as we demand democracy.org is a quite specific request, as is the request in line 192. The move to amend Interfaith Caucus is going to be very significant in moving forward not only the UUA, UUs all over the country, but all faiths to work together to demand that our leaders in, in Washington enact meaningful legislation and ultimately, hopefully, we can work towards amending the Constitution to eliminate corporate constitutional rights and money as speech so we can do meaningful work at the states and lower to protect our democracy and our environment and our planet for the future and for the future of all our children and grandchildren. Thank you. The motion has been made. Is there a second? All right. This requires a simple majority in order to pass. Is there any further discussion on incorporating the amendment? Are you ready to vote on incorporating the amendment? Okay. I see an off-site delegate at the procedural mic. Richard Sengus, Unitarian Universalist Congregation, Santa Rosa, California. How does this new amendment Q get handed for off-site delegates? I think that meant handled, probably. A uh, handled, yes. So when you're trying to m move an amendment, make sure that whatever amendment you want to move has the letter. I need to know the letter so that uh, the folks on the floor down here for me can handle it in order. Does that make sense? Okay, awesome. Another question? We are on A right now. Any other questions? Everyone know where we are? You don't seem to want to discuss the amendment? I think you're ready to vote on it. All right, so all those in favor of including and incorporating Amendment A found on page six of your CSW alert or in the app, please raise your orange voting cards now. All those opposed? Any abstentions? We will be incorporating that. All right, I'm gonna to go to the delegate at the procedural mic. Hello, my name is Sir LeBaire Jr. I'm a board trustee at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Akron and I would like to call the question. There has been a motion to call the question. Is there a second? Okay, this is not debatable. We're going to move to an immediate vote. We need a two-thirds majority in order to call the question. All right. If, so this means we're going to stop discussing the statement of conscience. We've made one incorporated amendment. So it now is the statement of conscience with the incorporated amendment A. Everyone understand what happens if we stop debate now. Right now, we're just voting to stop debate. We are not voting on the statement of conscience as amended. Make sense? Okay, so if you want to stop talking about it, which means no more amendments, go ahead and raise your orange voting card now. Again, this requires a two-thirds majority. All those opposed? Any abstentions? I think you don't want to do that. All right, so we're going to go ahead and continue debate. The next unincorporated amendment is in order. Yes. I do. Give me just a second. There's there's a queuing issue. So everybody, breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in again and breathe out. Put your feet on the floor, ground yourself, stretch. Stretching is good. 
So there's no, we are, there's, the, the statement of consciousness is not the moderators or the boards, okay? So there is no one way or the other way from us. So if people feel like they have not been recognized, we are, we're doing the best we can. The procedural mic takes precedence. So that's what's happening. Please do not allow me to ignore you. It is not my intention nor my desire to do such a thing. What we are doing today is entirely too important for voices not to be heard that urgently need to be heard. Do we understand? Every voice in this assembly can be heard so long as it is the will of this assembly. I recognize the delegate at the off-site procedural mic. Thank you. Richard Sengus, Unitarian Universalist Congregation, Santa Rosa, California. Please clarify that off-site delegates make moves to amend in the procedural queue if that is the correct place. That is the correct place. And I'll just also explain this for the whole hall. In, in a traditional Roberts Rules of Order framework, amendments would just be in the order for procedural issues to make things easier for us. We have a separate amendments mic as well as a procedure mic. So that's why for offsite delegates, we only have pro concern and procedure, but here we have more mics and that's the way we're used to using it. We're gonna get better on that next year. Okay. So there is a speaker at the amendment mic that is in order. I recognize the delegate at the amendment mic. Um, Aspen, um, you, you, Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Dago County, San Juan, Texas. Um, I, I was the line B, the unincorporated amendment on environmental. I moved to make uh, it incor in incorporated into the amendments. Okay, can you just say the letter again? B. B. Okay, there has been a motion to incorporate unincorporated amendment B. Is there a second? Second, all right. Is there any discussion or would you like to further advocate for that? Um, I would just, in the lining, when it talks about people of color, I just feel it is sort of unspecific, especially as I'm from the border lands, and I just think that we must incorporate fighting the border wall as a environmental issue for people of color. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to speak in favor or against incorporating this amendment? Right. The rationale of your Commission on Social Witness is that that specific amendment is already addressed in a different statement of conscience, which is why they did not incorporate it. Okay. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Good morning, Everardo Aguilar, First Unitarian Universalist Church of San Diego. I have a point of personal privilege. Go for it. I have a safety concern, and I remember moderator Alondria yesterday mentioned her highly dangerous allergy to citrus, and I smelled citrus oil a few minutes ago. So if there was a delegate who had anything with citrus, or if anybody has citrus products, please take them out of the room. We do not want to kill our moderator. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Everardo. You're speaking in favor of the amendment? Yes. All right, I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Uh, Kendra Munz from Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Venice and UU Justice Florida State Action Network. Um, I totally agree with incorporating this amendment which says, compounding this corruption is the existential threat of a global climate crisis which our current federal government is failing to address. The impact of this crisis will fall most heavily on low-income communities of color. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. We can no longer wait for that to happen. We must act to bend that arc now or face the unthinkable consequences of a destroyed environment and unlivable planet. If we are to rise to the moral challenge inherent in the climate crisis, we must embrace the struggle to achieve an uncorrupted democracy. I totally support this amendment, and yes, it will affect um, people of all the early the First Nations and everyone who lives in this country. We need this for ourselves, our children, and the future of this country and this planet. Um, I encourage, and by the way, we, I did look up that statement of conscience you said earlier. That was in 2006, 12, year, 13 years ago. 
I mean, come on, we haven't done that much to improve anything. It's gotten worse into what our government is not doing to, to address the issues of the climate crisis. Now is the time to act, and now is the time to enforce this strongly again. It's critical for the future of our planet and our existence. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I just need to double check. Is the delegate I have in the off-site procedural mic, is that an amendment or another point of procedure? Okay, so we're gonna take the delegate at the on-site procedural mic. My name is Sandra Kroll, and I'm from the Unitarian Universalist Church of Long Beach, California. I participated in the mini-assembly on this, and my question has to do with the role of the straw polls that were taken there. There was a reference to that in regard to the mini-assembly on the uh, amendments to the bylaws. And I just wonder, particularly, maybe the, a member of the uh, commission can explain what role did that play in these unincorporated amendments? Thank you. Uh, I can handle this one, because a straw poll is just a non-binding procedure. It allows the group to see, okay, is this uh, strongly supported, is it not very strongly supported, but final determinations get made by the Commission on Social Witness, which is in our bylaws. Would it, would it have had a role in the order in which they were placed on the final? Would a commissioner like to speak to that? Uh, yes, this is... I recognize the commissioner at the concern mic. Uh, hi, this is Shafia Christos Rogers from First Unitarian Church of New Orleans and a member of the CSW. And when we did, um, when we did the um, straw polls, we were divided into four different groups and we collected about many of the things that got raised. There was conversation. We did a straw poll and noted it on the forms. When we came back into the room and we had to go through how, which amendments to incorporate and which ones not to, we used the information about the straw polls and each of us told what we heard in our, in our um, groups that discussed these, the statement and we used that information to make the, agree, make the decisions. The ones that we felt we were, we thought maybe yes, maybe no, but we want, we felt like it needed to be the decision of the, um, th they were the most important for this body to consider were the ones that are being led right, being read right now, or they, they were ones that had the strongest in the straw, in the straw polls. Is that clear? So all of, we, all of the, every single amendment that was submitted was turned in. Not all of them merited a straw poll, but the ones that were substantive, we did straw polls on, and we discussed that, and that was how we prioritized the, uh, the unincorporated amendments that you're looking at. Any? All right, that seems to have satisfied the delegate's curiosity. I have a quick thank you. Uh, that was a confirmation uh, wave I just got. I have an update from our Usher Teller crew. We are out of paper copies of the CSW alert, and we just want to make sure if people need one or can share one, can you raise your hand or raise your orange card? Anyone need a copy? So we have a few, just keep those raised. Okay, I'm going to acknowledge the delegate at the concern mic. Good morning, thank you everyone. My name is Lori Stevens from the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Nashville. Uh, while of course, like many millennials, I feel very passionate about fighting against climate change, I am excited that we have an action of immediate witness coming up, that uh, it has very specific actions included in it in order to combat climate change. This, I worry, slightly may muddle the um, statement of conscience because it's supposed to be focused on democracy. And while, of course, these things are intertwined, uh, I think when we are trying to get a message out about one thing, we should focus on it. And then we also have the action of immediate witness regarding climate change. Um, thank you. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Mr. Moderator, I'm Jerry Meisner, Raleigh North, Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Raleigh, North Carolina. I, I want to ask a naive question. Is there any way possible to consider these unincorporated amendments except one at a time? 
Can we group them, or is there any way to speed it up? I mean, will the commissioner speak to that? Uh, I recognize the commissioner at the amendment, Mike. Just to, re to allay for, uh, fears, we're not going through all these unincorporated amendments. The only ones we will go through are ones that someone feels strongly enough about that they would like to put in. And as far as I know, there's only one additional one that anyone wants to bring forward after we uh, um, decide on this one. Yeah, we're, we're close, friends. We're close. Um, we need to end in about 20 minutes. And I think we'll take about that much time. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. All right, I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Thank you. My name is Allie Tharp. I am a member and delegate of the Wildflower UU Church in Austin, Texas. I'm also the program director for our Unitarian Universalist Ministry for Earth. Um, I really thank the, peop the person who brought up this amendment. I can't emphasize enough how important it is that our democracy has corrupted to the point that it is killing our planet, and it's important to include it in this statement of conscience. So I want to bring up two things in particular. Levi Draheim, who lit the chalice for us twice, is suing our government for failure to take action on climate change. This has been brought to the Supreme Court twice already, because, and it hasn't even gone to trial yet, because the government is trying to throw it out and prevent it from even going to trial. There, so, so the accountability of our government for causing the climate crisis is, is a five-year monkey wrench of the democratic process. And we need to say, we need to support Levi and include this in saying that our democracy is corrupted to the point that it's killing our planet and it's, it's compromising our ability to, to live. Um, secondly, the UUA has already endorsed a statement on the right to civil resistance of fossil fuel infrastructure. I'm from Texas. The Texas government has made it a felony to do the kind of activism that I do, and across this country is criminalizing protest against fossil fuel infrastructure of climate activists. The UUA has endorsed a statement on climate civil resistance that says popular consent is the predicate of democratic governments and may be revoked when the institutions of government have lost their allegiance to the public. The basic right of the people to replace a corrupt regime with a new social order based on justice and equality is immutable, and the law recognizes this principle of just resistance. So I want to say frankly that I'm disappointed in this statement of conscience for not recognizing our right to overthrow an unjust regime. I support it. I don't think it's strong enough. I think we should consider our revolutionary uh, rights under the Constitution and that we should support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay, your time expires. It's like that's, you were finished on time. All right, I recognize the off-site delegate at the concern, Mike. Thank you. I speak for Abigail Humphreys of the First Unitarian Church of Toledo, Toledo, Ohio. Statements of conscience are statements that inform the world of our stance on issues such as a, as a denomination. It does not matter how long ago the statement of conscience was made. Our stance has a denomination that has not changed. I would guess that would be our denomination has a stance that has not changed. They are not meant to infer actions that can be taken. Instead, the CSW will provide action kits to congregations to provide them with actions they can take on the statement of conscience. The statements are not just for the UUs, as it is for all the world to see. Okay, so that was not a concern. That should have come as a point of personal privilege from the procedural bank. All right, so that's a procedure. She was giving us information. She was not speaking in favor or against the amendment. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Uh, Sam King, you San Francisco. Uh, would I be in order to call for a vote on Amendment B? You would be, but there's no one at the pro mic, so you don't need to. Uh, so right now, we, we alternate back and forth, and now we can just go because that's the only thing that's in order, and we don't want to discuss this anymore. Yeah. Well, let's do that. All right, let's go ahead. <laughs> All right, looks like you're ready to vote on incorporating Amendment B. All right, if you're in favor of incorporating unincorporated Amendment B found on page six and continued on page seven of your CSW alert or in the app, go ahead and raise your orange voting card now. Go ahead and 
put them down. If you're opposed to incorporating this amendment, raise your cards now. This requires a simple majority to be incorporated. Go ahead and put those down. Any abstentions? We will be incorporating Amendment B. I recognize the delegate, the off-site delegate at the amendment mic. Sally Jane Gellert, Central Unitarian Church, Paramus, New Jersey. Uh, moves that Amendment I, Line 36, be incorporated because in our current political social climate, freedom from religion is less recognized than it has been in the past. There has been a motion to incorporate Amendment I, unincorporated Amendment I. Is there a second? I see several seconds. All right. Sally or anyone, would you like to speak in favor of the amendment? She's off site, so I'm going to give her a little bit of time. Is there anyone that is concerned? Right. I see you approaching the procedural mic. I don't want to know. Oh, you're going to the concern mic? Great. We'll wait till you get there. I recognize the delegate at the concern mic. Uh, my, well, now it's now it's not on the screen anymore, and I am. My concern is that the language. Can is I know your name and your. Um, oh gosh, gosh, I get so excited. <laughs> I'm Tom Zeller from the Towson Unitarian Universalist Church in Lutherville, Maryland. Um, as I read that language, I seem to I like the freedom both of and from religion, but does that include that I am get, have freedom from the press and from speech? Just as a mathematician who uh, reads a little bit. So I, I just, the, the language is, to me is a little funky. If it's not funky to everybody else, fine. Thank you. Time to wait. All right, I recognize the offside delegate at the pro mic. I'm reading for Sally Jane Gellert, Central Unitarian Church, Paramus, New Jersey. Basically, that the need to state clearly both freedom and of and freedom from religion. Right. C commissioners, are, you have a statement about how these concepts are already subsumed in one another. There also seems to be a grammatical issue. Are you comfortable correcting that for us? I recognize the commissioner at the amendment mic. If it. I recognize the commissioner at the amendment mic. If the delegates decide that they would like to make this an addition, then we can do grammatical perfecting. I recognize the delegate at the concern mic. Hi, I remember you. I remember you. And I love all of the co-moderators. Y'all are great. Well, we appreciate that. Dana Fisher Ashrawi, delegate from the recently founded Tapestry UU Church of Houston and vice president of UUs for Justice in the Middle East. I'm a little unclear about some of the concerns around this amendment from the offsite delegate. I'm a little confused by the wording. I I think my understanding is that we don't want religion imposed on us, and that's part of the intent, but it is grammatically awkward, as has been mentioned, and I think there was a statement from the off-site delegate that freedom of religion is not as much of a concern, and I would question that because I've heard of Islamophobia, for example. Women wearing hijab are being attacked on the street and denied jobs because they wear hijab. That's just one example and people are being shot in houses of worship, and I think that is a little bit of an attack on freedom of religion. So I'm just needing a little more clarification and I'm not sure if I want the amendment. Thank, Thank you. you. I recognize the off-site delegate at the pro mic. I'm speaking for Christy Stockman, Unitarian Universalist Church of Corpus Christi, Corpus Christi, Texas. I submitted this amendment, Christy Stockman from U2C3, Corpus Christi. From is important because atheists are rarely recognized. Okay, that, that's the whole statement, all right. I recognize the off-site delegate at the procedural mic. Thank you, I actually have two, so. 
Uh, Jan Tadeo, UU Congregation of Gwinnett, Lawrenceville, Georgia. Hey, Jan. The highlighted phrasing on the screen does not seem to present the amendment as I understand it. I understand it already states freedom of religion, and we are adding and from. Can we go ahead and pop the text back on the screen? Wait a second. Oh. Can we get the text of the proposed statement of conscience back on the screen? We're working on it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And our second person dropped off, so. Oh, the second person dropped off? All right. Not a problem. Okay. Let me just read that myself. Looks like we just didn't highlight enough of it. Is that correct? They're working on it. Give them a second, Jan. All right, there we go. Perfect. I recognize the off-site delegate at the procedural mic. Sally Jane Gellert, Central Unitarian Church of Paramus, New Jersey. As the person who moved the amendment, my intention is not to downplay the need for freedom of religion, but to equally emphasize the need for freedom from. Okay, so again, that wasn't procedure, that was a pro statement. She was advocating for her amendment. That should come from the pro mic. I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Uh, thank you. Uh, Carl Pononen, Unitarian Universalist Church of Greater Lansing. Um, I'm, I'm an attorney, um, so um, yeah, since I've been to law school, I sat in a class where we were taught freedom of religion includes freedom from religion, and that's, that's been ruled by the Supreme Court. Uh, we all have the freedom to choose any religion, such as Unitarian Universalism. Supreme Court has also ruled that that also means we have uh, the right to choose not to have any religion. Uh, but I do think this is important because not everybody who will read this will be an attorney like me or will have gone to law school. Um, so uh, you know, just reading the Constitution, it says freedom of religion, um, we need to include this to clarify that we are also supporting uh, freedom from religion, which, which, you know, technically the CSW is correct. The Supreme Court has ruled that of religion includes from religion, uh, but we need to state that so that any, any non-lawyers reading this document uh, understand what's going on. Thanks. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the con mic. Hi, Aaron White, Fourth Universalist, New York City. Um, I'm a lawyer too, if that matters. Uh, and I would uh, say that we ought to give more credit to folks. Um, there are a number of instances in our country where um, cases about uh, anti-establishment are, I mean, the Supreme Court just decided one recently about anti-establishment and whether or not there could be a cross at a particular place. And so I think people understand the concept um, that there is both the ability to exercise your religion and also not have one imposed on you. I think that's widely taught in our schools, I hope still. Um, but my other concern too is that uh, this particular section, you know, also refers to things that have more that we could say about them, such as press and speech, um, because speech also includes the right to freedom of assembly, all sorts of other things. Um, so if we're gonna, you know, go on this path, we're gonna be here a long time to really include all of it. So I think the fact that it simply says include uh, is enough for me because that means it's not an exclusive list. And so given both the general understanding I think exists in our society about religion and what the freedom of religion includes um, and also the fact that this statement is broad enough in and of itself, I would um, oppose the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. I recognize the off-site delegate at the procedural mic. Nope. That's a false in the queue. All right. I'm going to take, I've got four speakers in the off-site delegate queue and a couple in person. There's no one left at the concern mic. So do you still want to speak? Okay. I'm going to recognize the delegate at the pro mic. I'm speaking for Carmen Bell Delgado. First Unitarian Church of Wilmington, Delaware, Wilmington. 
Freedom of speech and protecting our environment is also critically important and should be part of the language in our bylaws, and we should be expected to abide by it and fight for it. Thank you. There is no one left in the concern queue, which lets me know that you are ready to vote. Are, are you trying to make sure that we vote on the amendment? Yes. You don't need to. There's no one else left to discuss this, so it is time to vote. All right. So all those in favor of incorporating unincorporated amendment I, I to clarify some information about freedom of and freedom from, please raise your orange cards now. This requires a simple majority. If you're opposed to incorporating Amendment I, raise those voting cards. Right. Any abstentions? Okay, can I see those in favor again? Okay, go ahead and put them down. We're going to wait for offsite. All right, that passes. We have included Amendment I. Is there any further discussion, there being no further amendments, is there further discussion on the Statement of Conscience as amended? Right. Give me just, I, I see her, I see her. You are out of time. You are out of time and technically it would not be appropriate to your pro statement, there's also, there are no additional concerns. There we go, all right. We are ready to vote on the statement of conscience as amended. This requires a two thirds majority vote. All those in favor of passing the statement of conscience as amended, please raise your orange voting cards now. All those opposed. That's surprising. Any abstentions? I think you really like this. We have passed the statement of conscience. How you doing? All righty, uh, Carrie. He's coming. All righty. So here's what we're about to do today. We're about to sing, aren't you excited? All righty, so, mm. so yesterday, things happen, right, for all of us, and sometimes it's hard to remember where we're supposed to be and what it means for us to be here in brave space, right? So there's a song that always helps me bring back, and it goes like this, solid as a rock. Okay, but you have to be louder than me. Solid as a rock. Rooted as a tree. We are here. We are strong. In our rightful place. So I don't sing as good as other people, but that really is irrelevant. Are we ready? Solid as a rock. Solid as a rock. Rooted as a tree. We are here. We are strong. In our rightful place. Place. One more time. We are solid as a rock. We are rooted as a tree. We are here. We are strong. In our rightful place. Okay, look at somebody and you're going to sing it to them. Okay, ready? We are solid as a rock. We are rooted as a tree. We are, we are here, we are strong, in our rightful place, in our rightful place, in our rightful place, in our rightful place. Thank you. So I want to say a thing, that we are all in our rightful place. Okay, so hypocrisy is a thing. 
You can do one thing in the world and do another thing in your own house. So our job is to make them be equal, right? So we cannot fight for immigrant justice in the world and not welcome immigrants in our own house, and not just when they're in sanctuary, but when they're actually members of our churches, right? Right. So we actually have to treat each other and love and be willing to dialogue, right? So we just put stuff out there and say a thing and not be willing to go back and forth. I'm down to make mistakes. I make them all the time and I act the same from the stage and in public, right? So we also have to be willing to do that. So we're about to engage in a whole conversation about the power of we, and we're thank you for being here. So we continue our theme discussion this morning about what it means to be a faith community. We are here to grapple with the depths of the spirit and the scope of the great mystery and to figure out together how to find the strength and clarity to live a life of purpose, intention, liberation every day. At this General Assembly, we are exploring a new way of being with each other through the theme of our interconnection, the power of we. We've been following the threads of this all week together, the power of we, the possibility of we, the purpose of we, the struggle of we, and the joy of we. This morning, we will invite you deeper into conversation with yourself and each other in this room about what it is at the heart of our faith. We know that if we want a Unitarian Universalism that is thriving, not just surviving y'all, but thriving, we must get clear about what is at the heart and bolder about what it calls for us to do. Are you ready? Yeah. Similar to our theme program yesterday led by the Commission on Institutional Change, our discussion will be organized around three critical questions. The first, when is a time that you felt the power of we in Unitarian Universalism? Two, what is so important in Unitarian Universalism that you would be willing to sacrifice for it? And three, what will it take for Unitarian Universalism to fully embody the power of we? Good morning, all. I'm Kerry McDonald. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Unitarian Universalist Association. I appreciate that. Our first question this morning is, when is the time that you have felt the power of we in Unitarian Universalism? It arises from our first faithful source, direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and openness to the forces that create and uphold life. At the UUA, we've been gathering stories of times when our congregations and communities embodied the power of we. And I wanted to share a few of those with you. This spring, the five Unitarian Universalist congregations in Mississippi have been renewing their ties. UUA Southern Region staff visited each congregation to work on building relationships. A cluster weekend in Jackson, Mississippi this March featured a tour of the UU Church of Jackson's new location, remarks from Jazz Brizak, a member of the Oxford Congregation, and the first female Rhodes Scholar from the University of Mississippi. Discussion groups, worship, and a visit to the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. It was a breakthrough in attendance by people of color and youth. In fact, plans are now underway for a Mississippi UU Youth Summit. In Maine, in Maine, the UU Church of Saco and Biddeford and the Sanford UU Church have a history of working together. They entered a new phase of their relationship three years ago when they jointly hired an interim minister who helped them deepen their collaboration. 
Last year, they formed a joint ministerial search committee and have now called their first shared minister, the Reverend Shea McKay. In the early 1950s, the First Unitarian Church of Cleveland, Ohio, split into two congregations after a very close vote committed the congregation to move from the city to the new suburb of Shaker Heights. Those who remained formed another congregation committed to staying, the UU Society of Cleveland. But now, six decades later, after two years of deep discernment, the congregations reunited this January to create a new congregation under the name the UU Congregation of Cleveland. The UU Church of Boulder, Colorado joined the growing number of congregations willing to offer physical sanctuary to immigrants who are under threat of deportation. After the congregational vote, their largest tenant left in opposition taking a chunk of the church's budget with them. The congregation rallied, increased its own giving, raised money from nearby churches, and completed a Faithify crowdsource campaign to close the gap, so that when the call came last year to host a sanctuary guest, they were able to say yes. They are currently hosting Ingrid Encalada La Torre in Sanctuary, and we pray for her case's swift resolution. My personal answer to this question takes me back to the youth-led circle worship I experienced in high school as a UU. My peers from other UU congregations encountering the holy together in the same sanctuary, or sometimes under the stars. Singing ourselves into the space, as we heard this morning, we are a circle within a circle. The love of the divine was an actual hug. Nature's interwoven tapestry was the sound of thunder in our hands. The affirmation that you, yes, you, you too are worthy as someone looked deep into your eyes while you looked deeply into theirs invented and inherited rituals I will remember for the rest of my life. Do we choose our path in life or does the path choose us? The truth of collective salvation is that our destinies are inseparable. So much of our paths are chosen by the people around us in our families and our communities. I could not have imagined that I would find myself here on this stage, on this camera before you today, but others knew. Others saw potential in me and loved me to where I am in ways I can only appreciate in retrospect. Whose path are you shaping today? Who is shaping yours? Do we have the courage, the humility to live open-hearted in a world where we hold one another in the palm of our hands while knowing we are being held at the same time? When you think about when you have felt the power of we, think about when you most knew this interdependence to be true, when you felt it in your bones. Thank you for sharing your truth. Your stories matter. The second question, what is so important in Unitarian Universalism that you would be willing to sacrifice for it. For me, the answer to this question is simply that I am willing to sacrifice for the saving, loving message of Unitarian Universalism. I would not be alive today if it were not for this message. I've known my gender identity since I was very small, probably about age four or five. Because of being raised UU, and our insistence on lived experience as part of the holy defining of life, I was able to trust my own understanding of my identity. I was never taught that my internal truth was wrong or unholy, as so many queer and trans folk are taught today. That teaching, that trusting of my inner voice and experience and God's love, however you define God, the trusting of love of community, that message was truly life-saving for me. As an adoptee, I've always been very aware of our faith's impact on my life. 
Had I not been raised in a family that embraced the pluralism of Unitarian Universalism, I wouldn't have had the creativity and capacity to live my life in the ways that I have. I had to be creative because there were few or no role models for non-binary people when I was growing up. So I never take for granted the fact that I was raised by a family that gave me the gift of a faith with such a loving message. But at the end of the day, sacrifice is also about letting go of something that we hold dear individually, that thing that is holding back the collective we. Sacrifice is about what, for the love of the faith, each of us is willing to offer up and let go of. When people collectively come together in faith, we become more than our human limitations. And when we enter into a faith community, we are entering into a space that exists beyond us as individuals. So the sacrifice that we are called to do is a loving letting go of what keeps us separate from one another. That letting go is different for each of us, depending on social location and power. Already, most UUs with multiple marginalized identities have made great sacrifices and regularly continue to sacrifice in order to believe that this faith can live into its fullest potential. If practicing this faith has not already asked a lot of you in terms of your own comfort, it's time to consider what you need to lay down on the altar that is dear to you but keeps you out of connection to others in our faith community. Allowing ourselves to be changed is what allows our communities to thrive. In many ways, I have sacrificed, or I prefer to say dedicated, my life to our faith. From becoming a Sunday school teacher at age 11, to revitalizing my congregation's youth group as a teen, to serving on the UUA staff as a young adult, to going to seminary, to serving in congregations, to saying yes to being your co-moderator. The reason I keep showing up for our religion that has let me down time and broke time and again and broken my heart time and again is because I want that same loving, saving message that I have internalized to be available to everyone. At our best, Unitarian Universalism embodies a love that is all-encompassing and a pluralism that is truly embodying the both and of communities. We can build the world that can coexist, find meaning together, and encourage one another's spiritual growth. That is the saving message. But the word sacrifice comes from the Latin word sacre and facere, meaning to perform sacred rites. As you think about what is so important in Unitarian Universalism that you would be willing to sacrifice for it, I also invite you to think about this process of letting go, this practice of giving up me in service to we as a sacred right. What makes this an act of faith is trusting that making a sacrifice and moving through the feelings of loss or fear or discomfort that might accompany it will eventually and ultimately bring you more joy, more fulfillment, more love. The question of what in Unitarian Universalism is worth sacrificing for gets at the heart of why this religion matters, not just as a place to go on Sundays, but why it matters in your life and the world. Thank you for, being open, for opening your heart to the question and the answers that arise. So question number three. <laughs> Can you put it up there for me, please? What will it take for Unitarian Universalism to fully embody the power of we? One more time. What will it take for Unitarian Universalism to fully embody the power of we? Can people close your eyes for a minute? Put your feet on the ground. And I can see you. Put your feet on your scooter. Put your feet down, because we're about to do embodiment. Close your eyes, breathe in, and breathe out. Breathe in, and breathe out. When you hear the word liberation, liberatory spirit, liberatory life, liberatory possibilities, what does that conjure in your soul? When you hear we 
are the liberating force, spirit, light, and love. What does that conjure in your spirit? When you hear that we have the power to transform the world around us, what does that mean in your bones? When you hear we are the people that we have been waiting for and are are, how does that feel in your blood? We are the light, we are the wisdom, we are the ancestors, we are those yet to come. How do we fully hold all of that in ourselves? Blinker, open your eyes, look at the people around you. Imagine the babies that aren't here. My happiest thing was with middle school camp yesterday. And I remember they're the reason why we are here. It's not some of the people that I run into every day, but it is those 11, 12, and 13-year-olds that desperately need our faith to be what they have called us to do, right? Desperately. If you were not at Synergy yesterday, watch it immediately. Because our young people need us to get ready and move so that we can be the faith that holds them in and the people that say you are worthy now. So for me, what it's about up to fully embody we and my 41 seconds left is that I was raised up in a church that has loved me the whole time. Now still, love me then and love me now. That's embodiment of we. Not now you are mad and you're mean, so we're like kicking you out. But we want all of you and your annoying, unnecessary self at times. <laughs> and to have a minister ask me what I needed to stay in my church. What I needed to feel that my church was still mine. So what I'm asking of you is to ask each other, what do you need for this church to be yours? And to listen to people when they say what they need. And if it's not nice to other people, maybe not do it, but do it in love and care. And go out and organize. And I just need to say this thing. It is not about going to the border. The border is in everybody's communities. To fully embody we means doing the work at your home, not just going somewhere else. And right now we have ICE agents coming where I live and where you live. And so when we get out of this place, please do the work in your spot, not just how it's easy. Thank you. Julia Landis and Cami Horn, the business managers for the GA youth staff. This year, these theme conversations are a big part of the business at GA. We want to share with you our perspective on the power of we and why we believe that centering youth voices is so crucial to these multi-generational discussions. As a UU youth, I have great expectations for how our denomination can shape the world. We, we are the, ne the next generation to carry Unitarian Universalism forward. So when we express our opinions today, we do it to shape our future selves. Our generation deals with so many unique challenges. Technology, the rise of social media, gun violence, a warming planet, and irreversible climate change. Historically, young people have often helped lead change. In our denomination, the youth and young adults were among the first groups to begin to merge Unitarianism and Universalism. In other social movements, youth sat in at lunch counters and desegregated schools across the Jim Crow South. 
protested against the Vietnam War and called for democratic reform at the Tiananmen Square protest in China. Youth have always known the power that can be harnessed from many of us working together. When I think of the power of we, I think of music. For my school's band to be successful, we all have to appreciate what each person does to come together into one sound. Woodwinds carry the melody, brass make the sound fuller, and percussion keep time. This can be challenging, but it is definitely rewarding. At my school, a Title I school, where the financial resources, where we have the financial resources many wealthy suburban schools enjoy, our band makes up for this by drawing on our unique talents and the hard work and spirit we bring. This power of we extends to our community with the help of parents, small businesses, and staff members. Because of this, we consistently score in the top tier of concert and marching competitions. Every summer, my youth group serves a community for a week, rebuilding houses with the Appalachian Service Project. There, I have seen our group come together and feel the power of the crowd. One year after my group had finished creating a safe entranceway to our homeowner's home, she told me and my group that our work and devotion had made her believe they were good people in this world again. The power that not only my youth group had, that not only the other youth groups at my center had, but all the youth groups at all the centers across all of Appalachia had and continue to have every summer through ASP shows the power of the collective. So many people's lives have been completely altered through ASP motivating hu huge groups of youth to create change. It can get overwhelming to think of all of the problems that my generation will face in the future. But the power of we reminds me that there's always a way forward. Youth have a different perspective on the world's problems and a sense of urgency. So when you hear from us, we hope that motivates you to keep fighting for a positive change. The movements in a piece of music can change quickly, as can situations in the world. We will undoubtedly face new and difficult challenges as time goes on. To counteract this, Unitarian Universalism must respond with all of our voices, experiences, and perspectives to amplify our sound to make sure that our message of love, justice, and respect is heard. In assemblies of people, there are two different types of power. There is a motivating power that enables people to create large and powerful change, and there is the power that binds us. Unitarian Universalists have felt this motivating power for a long time, being on the front of large social movements affecting our country. We are now at a time where we need to work on us need this binding power as much as the motivating power in order to face the change that we need to make and do the work that needs to be done we need to also have ideas and theology that can unite us and keep us bound together during the trying times ahead Reverend Sophia Betancourt, I serve as the Assistant Professor of UU Theologies and Ethics at Star King School for the Ministry. I am Dr. Elias Ortega Aponte. I serve as a member in the Commission of Institutional Change. I'm also President elect of Meadville Lombard Theological School. Drawing on our inherited theological tradition to more fully engage the power of we allows us to be intentional about the ways that we move through the world as a faith community. 
If we are to affirm the power of we as central to our faith, we need to be committed to the work of collective salvation. That language encourages us to move out of our comfort zones, a comfort that some feel entitled to, but has caused far too much harm in our community. The idea instead that we are saved together means we invest in communal accountability and shared work for justice as the very things that give our lives value, even in the face of all that seeks to drive us apart. We choose instead, by our living, to bear witness to another way, a way that moves us out of toxic individualism into the community of communities, as Paula Cole Jones asked of us in this year's FAS lecture. If we believe in collective salvation, we must also believe in collective sacrifice. It is powerful that our faith community is working to reclaim the sacred practice that Barb spoke of just a few moments ago. And claiming what it means to be sacred in personal sacrifice without the power of we is the very thing that desecrates the practice. The belief in collective salvation means that there cannot be small groups of UUs whose personal sacrifice we depend on every time to move us forward as a collective whole. That kind of hierarchical membership undermines the very inherent worth and dignity that we lift up as our first principle. Living into the power of we hold us accountable to preparing the legacy of theological harm we have perpetrated against some in our community. Believing that we are all saved together, that one life cannot reach its greater meaning unless we center the liberation of all, means not only a willingness to invest in one another and in the greater good, but also responding faithfully to the call to live into the work together. Julia and Cami reminded us that even in the face of oppression, suffering, and the legacy of white supremacy culture in the world, we believe that there is a way forward. We aspire to transform and be transformed by love and justice. And to take a cue from disability justice activist, Dia Lakshmi Pisensa Samadishna, who details how often we draw resources for, for resistance from systemic oppression. To affirm the power of we as a faith community, we need to strengthen ways for our people to draw nourishment and strength from this faith. We must fashion ourselves into a faithful people that draw wisdom from our inherited tradition. This is not an individual task, but a collective practice. Alandria reminded us that everyone deserves to be asked what do you need to make this your church? That we might draw on that message of interconnectedness, of the circles within circles that we sang of this morning. Another way to think about this is how do we live with a deep and abiding commitment to the call of the power of we? I invite you to rise and body your spirits, friends. We're going to sing the Fire of Commitment, text by Reverend Mary Catherine Morn and the music by Jason Shelton. And fill it up. Fill up your body and come on out with the Fire of Commitment. Go ahead and give us a tempo there.
is such a joy to sing. We've named the essential role of our discussion today to dig into the heart of our faith and our collective power it can catalyze. We heard stories from UU congregations and you heard from those on this stage how we would reflect on these three essential questions. We had originally planned to have time to break out into discussion groups as we did yesterday, but because we reoriented the business agenda so that we could have time for discussion there, we're not gonna be able to have the breakout sessions we planned today. However, the questions are available in the GA app, and we are going to be posting ways for you to submit your feedback about your responses to these questions. We encourage you to take them home to your congregations, to talk about them over lunch, to engage them in other spaces you may have over the rest of this General Assembly. And as I said, we'll be posting the, uh, the app and on the website places where you can share your feedback to these three essential questions. Thank you for journeying with us to try a new way of engaging faithfully with one another at General Assembly this year making time for these deep and open-ended conversations on what lies at the heart of our faith. May your discussions be rewarding, renewing, and powerful. I highly recommend they be your lunchtime conversations. <laughs> that said, there being no further business to come before us and in accordance with the schedule set forth in the, your program book, I declare that this general session of the General Assembly shall stand in recess until 4.30 p.m. today, Saturday, June 21st, 2019.